Welcome back to the Small Business Show, where you get to hear the journey, find the challenge, and create solutions. I'm your host, Lori Brooks, and I thank you so much for joining me today. If you're enjoying the show, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. This evening, I have a very special guest to introduce the happy entrepreneur himself, Shay Brown, founder of the Easy Sales Hub, executive producer of the docuseries Making of an Entrepreneur, and the host of the Happy Entrepreneur Show the number one business development and revenue generation late night show in the country. Shay, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today. I'm excited to be here, Lori. Thanks for all that you're doing, the difference that you're making for small business owners everywhere. You're not only providing valuable resources to them, but you give them exactly what they need to be successful, not only in their business, but for their community and for their family. So thanks to you and your team for all the work they do over there. We appreciate you. Say you are outstanding, and I have only learned from some of the best. So kudos to you. I appreciate you, and I'm very excited to have you on the show today and to dive into your journey. But before we do, I want to rewind the clock just a bit. I want us to go back to the days of, say, high school, college. Think about a time when one of your parents or a mentor was asking you, Jay, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was your answer to that question back then? Yeah, so I think back then when I was in high school, I was at uh, Garfield Senior High School down in Dale City, Virginia, and I was living with Mother Deer, by the way. Yeah, I'm a ping pong kid. For those that know the area, I I grew up in Washington, D.C., but yet my mom and dad divorced, so I would spend some time down in Dale City, Virginia, and then my mom get mad at me. I'd probably get in trouble, I should say. I'd go back up to Washington, (laughs) D.C. Don't judge me. Don't judge me out there, by the way. But I want to go to a time when I was in... Hill City, Virginia, at Garfield Senior High School, and I'm in the 11th grade. And I didn't know what I wanted to be. I was a trouble kid, so like, unlike many of your folks who know me sit in this seat, they're probably scholars, A students, you know, they, they have that cool story. That wasn't my jam. Uh, my jam was I used to get in trouble. And so I wasn't always doing what I should be doing. I remember this conversation sitting in the office. At the time, there was Mr. Bradshaw and there was Dr. Bradshaw and there was Dr. Linda Rowland. She was our guidance counselor. And they proceeded to tell my mom at that time, and her name is Dr. Cammie B. Jeffers, that I should probably be looking at vocational school alternatives because obviously I wasn't going to be college material. And I'm sitting there thinking, they're right. I mean, no way I'm going to go to college. I mean, I, I, my grades, if you knew my grades, I didn't have a 2.0. I had like a 1.0. Right? <laughs> and, and, and you tell me, who, what do you want to be? They were telling me what I wanted to be because I didn't know. What's mm-hmm. the point for those folks that are watching? I'm sitting there and I'm buying into this idea. Mother dear looks over at them with fire in her eyes. My mom, I grew up in the Pentecostal church. For those that want to know, my mom was a bishop back in the 70s when it was popular being a bishop as a woman, by the way, in a Pentecostal church. Still might not be popular, by the way. But anyway, she's there. And she says with so much clarity, Jay's going to college. He's going to be somebody. I don't know what it is, but he's going to be somebody. He's not going to nobody's vocational school. And I'm thinking, I'm quiet. Because I'm a kid, I'm looking down the ground like, Okay. And the reason I say that to you is that I didn't know what I wanted to be. And so while someone tried to tell me what I wanted to be, I was fortunate to have someone to believe in me. And the point I want to make to the audience is sometimes you need someone to believe in you before you believe in yourself. You may still be an adult. Sometimes as an adult, and I have my AARP card, so you could fast forward 40 plus years later, 35 plus years later, I got my AARP card and I'm still not sure what I want to be. I mean, you know, I know what I am. I don't know what I want to be. I got a whole lot of life left. So that moral of the story is sometimes someone needs to believe in you. You need to hold their belief when you don't see something that's possible and step into it. And isn't that what entrepreneurship is about? Isn't that what it's about Very being a small story. business owner? And then some days you feel like you're on an island and you're wondering and question, should you be doing it? Not because of the money, but because of the time, because of the effort, because of the customers, because of what it takes to get things done. I'm going to encourage you to hold a belief. We need you as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner. Thanks for all that you do. It wasn't a journey that you were planning. 
It wasn't something that you were thinking through. This was something that was not even something that your mother understood as to what it was she was instilling. But she said to you, you're going to be someone. She believed in you. Holding on to that belief in and of itself is what propelled you to move forward. So what, what was that journey? What did that look like as you move forward? Lack of recognition as to what you were planning to do on this journey. What were those steps? What did that look like? What it looks like is, is someone who, when he finished high school, had to go to summer school to actually earn his diploma. So I had a chance to walk on stage. He didn't have the grades at the time to be able, be eligible to graduate. And I found myself in summer school taking two classes. I was taking two classes during the day and two classes at night, not because I was a, on, a, on a bus that I couldn't learn. It was that I wasn't going to school. I wasn't doing some of the things that I should be doing. And I guess as the folks would say today, I wasn't applying myself. And I mm -hmm. only went to school because of my mom. You've got to get your degree. I mean, you're going to get this high school diploma. And my father at the time, Marshall Brown, he's no longer with us, passed away uh, May 2nd, 2017. He had made a path for me to get into the University of District of Columbia, which was a junior college or was a college at the time, a college to get into. And so there was a for me to get in on a probational period. Now, why do I say that to you? I say that to you to say that my path so far, and maybe it's like many of yours out there or some of the people out there, you have to put in the work. Just because someone opens the door doesn't mean you get to walk in and enjoy the benefits. So I had to go to summer school. She wanted to know the path and the story. And I don't know if it's okay to tell you this stuff, but I, I went to summer school. I don't think I've ever shared this ever on a podcast, but I, I found myself in summer school. After summer school, I got into the University of the District of Columbia and it was an eye opening for me because now I'm the oldest of four. I have a younger brother who I'm very close with and two sisters that are younger than me. And so my, my, my expectation was he's made it in. He's going to get out. Now here's, I'm going to come down a home stretch now and I'll fast forward, go to junior college, find myself getting started, took reading medial courses. And I did that only because I was on probational status and I knew I had to at least get a C. And I didn't know that that reading medial reading and math and Spanish and other courses I was taking would be the foundation that would springboard me on to Morgan State University, which I transferred. It allowed me not only to go to Morgan State University, but become the president of my class. Seems like a thousand years ago, by the way. And then go on and do some amazing things. But when I finished Morgan State University, I got an opportunity to get into corporate America. And I got an opportunity to work for Citibank. So I was recruited from Morgan State. One of only six people to put into this high-end executive training program. The only one that looked like me. And from there, my career flourished, right? Because I worked for Citibank. And then after... I left Citibank after graduate school. So yeah, I made it to graduate school. Can you imagine? I went to Johns Hopkins University, which is in Baltimore, Maryland, school I never thought I could get in in my life and got my MBA and then went on to work for Verizon for the next nine years. So I only worked for two companies my entire career. And then I'm coming down on home stretch and coming back to you now, Lori. But two companies my whole career. Then back on May 31st, this is how I got to where I'm at now. Verizon gave me the pink slip. So they were MCI, then they were WorldCom, mm -hmm. then they became Rising, and then they gave me the pink slip. And I walked into the office and I'm thinking we're laying some people off because by the end I was a hot shot young director. By the way, I'd risen through the ranks. I mean, I was he, I guess is what the young folks call today. I was he before there was a he. <laughs> and they looked over at me and they're like, hey, Jay, I've got some news for you. We've got to let some people go. Cool. Mm -hmm. We let people go before. Who is it? <laughs> I've done this before. I'm, I'm prepared, straight, straight face. What's the package? Who is it? What's the message? Kind of in so many words. And he says, we got to let you go. I'm thinking, what? Have you ever got hit with the punch you never saw coming? Mm -hmm. Or maybe had the rug pull from underneath you and you just didn't even know it? Mm -hmm. I was floored. I mean, corporate America was my jam. I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. Never wanted to be a small business owner ever in my life. And now I was let go. I had some severance. About nine months of severance. They gave me a nice little package before I left. And riding home, my friends had their own company. And I thought to myself, hey, if my homies can start a company, maybe I'll start a company. So I started a company by going to Kinko's, having some business cards made up. And the next day, I hung my shingle out the door and called myself Coach Shea. I didn't know what to call myself. I, mean, I was a coach back then. It was 20 years ago. This is back in 2004. Okay. Everybody was a coach. I said, I'll be a coach. I'll teach people how to do the things they want to do. And I got started and then I ran out of money. So we'll tell you the rest of the story later. But that's the <laughs> journey 
led me to where I'm at now. And I'm thankful for every part of it. Now, what can you take away from it? We can take away from it is no matter where you are, no matter what the setback is, no matter what the challenge is, there's only one thing you need to do, and that is keep going. I mean, you've got to make some just adjustments. You've got to recalibrate. I understand that. You've got to have a new plan. And I get that. But above all, whenever in doubt, keep putting one foot in front of the other foot in front of the other foot in front of the other foot. Maybe for you, it's the health situation. You're on track and off track. One foot in front of the other foot in front of the other foot. Maybe it's finances. One foot in front of the other foot in front of the other foot. You do that and keep moving forward. My promise mm -hmm. to you, my promise to you, tomorrow will be better than it is today. Very much so. And all of that started with the belief instilled by your mother. I absolutely love that story. And yes, baby steps is exactly how we continue down the path because without them, we're getting overwhelmed. You move too fast, burnout hits. And that's a yeah. real thing. So you have to recognize that you've got to take time to piece yourself, but you also have to have that belief, which is what sparked that entire journey. At first, you were not interested. In entrepreneurship, it wasn't a thought process. It wasn't a thing. It was irrelevant to you. The corporate world was your thing. And that I think is really important because some people have this feeling that their identity is wrapped up in what they do and who they once were or what they've accomplished within whatever industry they might be in. And it doesn't matter what industry you're in. It doesn't matter what roadmap you've gone down. There are moments in your roadmap that may take a different path than what you initially expected. And at that point for you, when Verizon gave you the surprise of a lifetime that day, you didn't turn around and just let it crush you. You didn't go back home and sulk. You didn't play victim. You got in the car and you said, what? Plan number two and made a pivot. And that's what this journey is truly all about, baby steps and pivoting. So I truly appreciate you bringing both of those out. What do you feel like were some of the hardest baby steps that you did take during the journey? And what do you feel like really helped you to move through those pieces? Yeah. You know, I left you at the point where I started the business and maybe you had this happen to you. And it's an old saying, and I know I didn't create it, but it's so true. The best intentions don't equal the best results. So I had the best intentions. I get started in this business. I'm thinking people are going to just come flocking to Shea Brown. And after about 90 days in business, I was tired. I was frustrated. In short, I was out of money. And hence, I learned the golden rule in business. Okay, out according to Shea Brown. No one's validated me on this yet, but I believe it is. The golden rule in business is to never run out of money. That's the golden rule in business. And the only way not to run out of money is really to make more sales. So yeah. now I'm out of money. I'm burning through my 401k. Don't judge me. I know many of you out there, you would never do that. So <laughs> I get it. I burned through my savings because I was betting on myself and I was betting on myself. I was double down betting on myself and I was losing no customers, no clients. Then at the time, my, my wife at the time, a second wife decides she's going to leave. Now, it had nothing to do with me probably being an entrepreneur. I wasn't doing some of the things I was supposed to do. I'll take full responsibility for it. Then you're running through the credit cards. You don't have a job. And how many of you know something that's already on shaky, shaky ground and you mm -hmm. layer on finances on top of it? If mm -hmm. you don't know, you don't know. It's okay. Maybe you never had that experience. <laughs> just know it just crumbled down. And so she leaves. And then, and then normally when the wife leaves or the woman leaves, I'll say it like that. Normally the kids go with them. Not in this case. Mm -hmm. My two sons decided they want to stay with dad. Wait a minute. Whoa, this is not how it's supposed to work. I'm not making any money. Now I've got four eyeballs <laughs> looking at me. I got to feed them. And then, I know, it's just, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And so I'm upstairs working like I am right now. And there was a knock at the door. And my son's coming upstairs. And someone's still in the car. What? I run down the steps. Oh. I go to the door. I look out the door and there's my Lexus truck. I love that Lexus truck. Emerald, yeah. pearl, tan leather seats. Oh, it was a beauty, by the way. <laughs> and, and, and there it is. And, and Jacob, he's, he's hosting up the car. Now, this isn't the first time our car has been repossessed. Okay. 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 I, don't jazz me. Don't jazz me. No me knocks at the door and lets me know this is going to happen. So I look over. <laughs> I look back at him. I give him what we call the brother, brother. He gives me the brother, brother nod back. I look over at my sons and I say, don't 
worry. The car is just going to the garage. I lied. And it was in that moment that I had what I call the never again moment. Now, maybe you've never had the never again moment. Maybe you had. I told myself never again would I find myself in that situation where I felt a failure as a husband, a failure as an entrepreneur, because certainly I'm broke, a failure as a father. I felt like a failure just as a man all the way around. What was your never again moment as you're out there watching now and as you're listening now? And if you didn't have one, that's okay. But maybe tell yourself never again would I find myself like Shea Brown down there taking showers at the gym because the water was cut off. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Okay. Don't judge me. Maybe you tell yourself never again would I find myself in that relationship that I shouldn't be in. Or maybe you tell yourself never again would I find myself borrowing money, Shea Brown, from family members that I know I can't pay back. What was your never again moment? And here's what I learned in that never again moment. I wish I could say I just turned things around, right? I just got up the morning and said, this is it. I'm back on stride again. That's a song, by the way. And I said, yeah, I am. I can do this thing. So I started double down, betting on myself some more. I'm betting on myself, burning through the 401k and other stuff. Now the cars repossess. A short while later, I was still losing. I found myself in bankruptcy. I don't judge me. I know many of you that, you know, you may have never been through that, but don't judge me, don't judge me, don't judge me. Okay, so now I'm in bankruptcy. And finally, I decided I had borrowed $5,000 from my brother. I haven't paid him back. Again, judge me, don't judge me. Because there was this idea to fly to California and meet this guy named Eric Loftholm. And, and he was going to have this five-day teaching that he was going to do, this course on teaching people how to be successful business owners. I was like, I'm going to do it. My family thought another get-rich scheme. There he goes again. But here's what I want you to know. You can always learn. You can always grow. And so I borrowed the five thousand dollars. I flew to Rockland, California. I'm there. There's only three of us in there. I'm like, where? I must have been the only fool to put down five grand. And, but here's what I want you to tell you. And here's the principle. If you're taking notes. Put this down in your notes. One good idea implemented is better than a thousand ideas you know right now. You only need one idea. You only need one idea. But you take one idea and you implement it, it can shift your whole business. While I'm there, and here's the idea he gave me that I'm coming down the home stretch. I don't know what time I got. I'm home, coming down the home stretch. He said, you know, Shay, you should focus on sales training. I just want to sales training. I'm not a sales trainer. I'm a business consultant. Don't you see my car? Shay Brown, business consultant. Oh, Shay. But the reality is nobody was hiring me to do any business consulting. <laughs> They didn't care about letters I had behind my name. They didn't care about any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I explained how I hated selling, to be honest with you. And he said, well, then you should look at selling as service. And here's what the breakthrough created for me and my business. And this is a Shayism. You can jot this down if you're jotting this down in your notes. And here it is. Don't chase the money at value and the money will chase you you. Don't chase the money. Just add value and let the money chase you. So I went from trying to sell people to saying, how can I serve? See, I believe that selling equals service. But then, you know, you're taking notes. Selling as a small business equals service. That people will pay you today if you just help them solve a problem today. So for an entrepreneur, I turned in the problem-solving business. And as a result, the business shifted. My energy shifted. My focus shifted. And as a result of doing that, well, we're the business we are now, 20 years, doing this full-time, all the time, right? Yes, we've written the best-selling book. I get that. Yes, we are number one producers of African-American experts in the country that are out there making money, being paid more for what they know that they can do. Yes, we help organizations build seven-figure sales teams. In fact, our seven-figure sales team system is legendary because of the evergreen revenue model that we've added to it. But it's not about all that. What it's really about at the end of the day is that we can help you serve, be yourself, be authentic, and in doing that, all you got to do now is share people how you solve a problem. And boy, my life's changed. My finances changed. I still had to put in the work. Still got to learn. Still got to adjust. But that's the story to the person you see today. And the reason I want to give you a little bit of that backstory, she gave me more time than most people probably get. I don't even know. 
But I want you to know the person that's in front of you today, Shea Brown you see, wasn't always the Shea Brown you see today. The way you might be looking at chapter 20, just know there was another 19 ahead of this one. Come on. So you probably understand where I'm coming from. Okay? So I'm happy. 100%. Back over to you, Lori. Thanks for letting me let the folks know that it was a journey. And that's where we are today. Jay, that's why I invited you, is to share that journey. That's exactly what we enjoy. And that's exactly what I appreciate. So I thank you for taking us back to your never again moment. Because we are familiar with that moment. We do talk about that moment quite often. That never again moment sometimes is that moment that sparks the journey for some. I so appreciate you sharing the multiple different ways that you went through the journey. You were Coach Shea. That's what you were going to do. That's who you were going to be. That's what you wanted to be. Even though other people were suggesting something that you personally didn't like, weren't interested in didn't think was going to su suit you in any way. And then you adopted the notion of selling equaling service. And once that became a part of your ethos and your paradigm, your world, it was this the shift for you that then unfolded. You may start in one location on your journey. You may be really excited about one piece of your journey. But something else may be introduced to you that you may be resistant to. But as soon as you find that harmony, the journey can then begin to unfold in a different manner. That energy, like you said, shifted for you. You saw the change in your income. You saw the change in your energy. You saw that change in your business and your practice. So thank you for highlighting how those shifts occurred and how that journey truly played out. You are the executive producer of Making of an Entrepreneur. So to share with us where you are in your journey now, Shay. You have built it out. You have your seven-figure sales team. Share with us a bit more about what you're doing and what you're excited for. Sure. One of the proudest moments I, I have where we are today is I think of Lennox, my grandson, right? So my first grandson, Lennox Lavelle Brown, was born a year and a half ago, by the way. So Prior to a year yes. and a half ago, it was just me and my wife and my two sons. And, and now there's this another life that's here, by the way. And so I guess you call me a grandpa, a g -pa. I don't know what I'm going to be called these days, but I'm someone <laughs> that's a proud grandparent. I'll say that. And, and it's kind of different because a whole family is like the nucleus of the family. Everybody's right here in the area. And so my son moved all the way up to me, all the way to Phoenix. And, and, and so I don't get to see my grass every single day. So I get really excited when I can see him on FaceTime or I see a photo or he's going to be flying into town, which will be here next weekend, depending on when they watch this. So I guess today I'm a grandparent. And then my, my other son, uh, my, my, I guess not my son, my daughter-in-law, my other son, my son's wife, which is my daughter-in-law, is expecting their first child. So I'm like, wait a minute, and it's going to be a girl. And then we met a girl. I'm not used to having girls. I had two boys, you know, and then a grandson, a girl. I'm not even sure how to handle this. So I'm going to say, what are you going to do? I say, well, I'll treat it like I do my marriage. The answer is always yes, baby. Yes. See, there's a lot of benefits just saying yes. So whatever my granddaughter asks for, the answer is yes. So you get a lot of benefits. Just say yes. Okay. This makes life so much easier. Okay. I don't know what the secret is, but I know one thing. Just say yes. And so, and so we're, we're hitting that, I think in two weeks as well. That's why my son's coming to town to go to a baby shower. And I haven't been to a baby shower in a thousand years. I mean, baby shower, but hey, you know, I got a grandson. I show up, I guess I'll be there with an old folks. We'll all go sit in the corner somewhere, I guess. So that's where I'm at today. That's that's what I'm really excited about. My wife and I get a chance to, to travel and do some amazing things that I never thought in a lifetime that I would be able to do. And that's a that's a blessing by itself. Um, so that's a little about what I'm doing. You talk about the business. I mean, that's, that's okay. I mean, we're, we're fortunate to have the number one late night show in the country, the Happy Entrepreneur Show, which you, you've been a part of and a pleasure to interview sitting on the other side, by the way. We have a morning show for, for CEOs. See, there was, a, there was a challenge out there, Lori, that a number of CEOs that I was working with, they're responsible for, some of them are responsible for the whole organization. But there's a department called the sales organization that inside of their company that generates revenue. And, and there wasn't a place that all CEOs had come together, some to understand, some to be reminded, some just to be in the conversation, just like you and I are. When you're in this conversation, when you join Lori Brooks' small business show, you're in the conversation with other entrepreneurs 
with other CEOs, with other folks are might be dual entrepreneurs working full time jobs and full time entrepreneurs that come together. So just like you're doing in your episodes, we ever do this every morning at eight a.m. Eastern Standard Time to bring these CEOs together. Now, why do that? Why show up for Lori Brooks Small Business Show? Why show up for the CEO Sales Huddle? I think it's CEO Sales Huddle for one reason. And as a principle, I'm giving you some philosophies. I've got 12 rules for life, by the way, 12 rules. But but one of them is success is a team sport. You can only get so far by yourself. Now, you're not going to be blown away by that idea. You're not going to jump up and down and shout. I get it and run around and probably hit the like button and make a bunch of comments. But I will share with you success at the end of the day is not a new idea. It is a team sport. So we're able to bring together CEOs to come together in a huddle to only talk about their sales organization. Oh, gosh, I love doing that. And then the other thing that I love doing, and this is all service component, there's no cost for it, is we have the benefit, Laura, you mentioned it, produce the number one docuseries for entrepreneurs today called The Making of an Entrepreneur. Can you imagine that out there, it didn't exist? Like, like we, we looked around and I wanted to be a part of something that, Somebody could share my story. Someone like Shea Brown, who's in the messy middle. Like, I'm not where I want to be. Oh, but I'm going to get there. But I know for certain I'm not where I used to be. I know, I know. Everything I learned, learned at Pentecostal Church. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Okay, okay. But it's so true. <laughs> and so one of the reasons I wanted to produce that is one of my 12 rules for life. Maybe I'll give you these rules later. There's no cost. But one of my 12 rules for life is systems beat goals every single time. But then you know, you're taking notes. Systems beat goals every single time because systems are duplicatable, systems are repeatable, and systems is something that you can give to someone else. So I wanted to understand the systems that help create the individuals that led them on the path they're on now. So we're we're really excited about that. We're in season five. It's been over 155 different entrepreneurs, and some of them are entrepreneurs, some of them are icons at what they do, some of them. Are we have, we have a retired judge, we have lawyers, we have doctors, we have folks at all different levels. It's really amazing to come together. You might say, Shay, what do you get out of it? I get to learn. I get to be a student. There's an old African proverb, by the way, if you want to know what's ahead in the road, ask someone who's coming back. Isn't that so true? So I get to ask folks, hey, what's up ahead? Okay, so that's what we're up to today. Our number one mission, if you want to talk about the business side, our number one mission in about a minute and a half is really helping entrepreneurs have the resources to execute the vision they have for the people they were called to serve. See, there's a there's a huge challenge out, out there, I believe, for small business owners. And I believe, and you don't have to believe it with me, but I believe the number one challenge facing entrepreneurs today is not having enough revenue. That means sales, by the way, mm -hmm. to do the things they were called to do. And imagine for a moment, I'll go back to my Pentecostal mother. <laughs> go imagine in the good book that you're Noah. And this is what I want you to think for a moment. And you have all the gifts that have been given to you. You've got all the guidance. You've got the blueprint. You've got the plan. But you ain't got no resources. Mm. There's no animals to help you. There's no wood. There's no nails. There's no hammer. And that's what a lot of small business owners were doing. They were sitting around with these tiff gifts and talents. And they're like, well, I'm here to serve more than just me in my circle of small circle. And then, but without sales coming in, it was very hard to be able to do that. So we have the pleasure every day of doing two things. Number one, helping entrepreneurs make sales by serving in their business so they have revenue coming in. And you think about it. And then this is, I'm on a rant, so I'll stop. But selling is the oxygen, according to Shea Brown for any great business in history. It's not, okay, not going to be super rocket science. But without sales, there's always more money going out, ask any business mm -hmm. owner, than there is coming in. And I haven't met one small business owner yet that doesn't matter mind spending the money when the money's coming in to do the good they were called to do. Mm -hmm. And so we take off the idea of selling to try to convince somebody and persuade someone to make them do what they don't want to do. And we lead it back to them serving folks Man, the business flourish, it grows, there's revenue coming in, changes their life, their family's life, their community life, and the cause they believe in, they, they, they want to write a check. I'll give you an example. Mother dear, I'm blessed to be a caregiver. And I don't think there's any greater honor than being a caregiver. I thought parent, like the greatest honor there was, but really to be a caregiver, 
I'm blessed. Mother dear, 77 years old, retired from the federal government after 38 years working for the same building, same agency, Department of Commerce. She retired at 55. She had 22 glorious years without working one day and now has Parkinson's. And recently we moved into what I call a resort, a senior, senior living facility, but it's a resort to me with all the benefits and things they have. So she can be in a community of other folks like her. Now it does cost. You got to write a big check, okay? Mm-hmm. And I want to tell you, it takes revenue to do that. Mm-hmm. It takes money to do that. So I believe that we all, and I'm coming to you now, Lloyd, we're all in the business of selling our beliefs, selling our values, and selling who we are. Even if you're saying, Shay, I'm not in sales. Well, think about this. Preachers, every single week, are selling faith. Whether you believe it or not, they're selling faith, okay? Teachers, oh gosh, they have the most horrible job in the world. Plus the teachers out there, every day they're selling education. They don't make a whole lot of money, okay? That, that I'm aware of. Parents, and some of you are parents, are godparents, are, are, are aunts, are uncles, or nieces, are your mentors. Parents every single day are selling values. Mm-hmm. And so the biggest sale you make every single day is to yourself to do the things you know you should do in order to be the person you want to be. So what are we up to these days? Helping entrepreneurs solve the biggest problem in their business, which is having the revenue they need by making sales and bringing cash flow in to do the things they want to do. And it's an honor and a privilege to be able to do that. I'm going to go ahead and validate you now, Shane. I don't know if anybody else has taken the time to do so, but we're validating it now. It is one of the biggest headaches for a lot of entrepreneurs. I've worked with plenty of them, and it is. It's, it's one of those things that, Everyone struggles with at some point, especially if you're pivoting from an alternate industry. If you've never done entrepreneurship before, you're not going to start off with sales and you need to find them in order to actually move forward. But I also and really if, and appreciate, if you're good, even if you're mm-hmm. great at selling and you're great at business, you always want more because when you make more money, you have more meaning in the world. By the way, we have more income coming into your life. You have more in as our philosophy and our belief, you can make a dollar and a difference at the same time, no matter what anyone tells you. So you're, you're right. We're all in this together as entrepreneurs, as small business owners. We all have to do this every single day. We got to find people with a problem and solve it. That's why we exist. Otherwise, we can go work for someone. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not illegal to work for someone. I'm curious. If you have the ability to go back, say, 30 years and tell yourself one thing, what do you feel like you would have told yourself? Yeah, 30 years ago, I was taking care of two boys, 30 some years old. Seemed like everything was going right on the outside, but just tore up on the inside, by the way. And so if I can go back and I could talk to myself and, and give you just, just one, one piece of advice, I would say, go for it faster. Like, don't hesitate. I mean, go for it faster because when you do things faster, you can enjoy the benefits longer, by the way. And what I mean by go for it faster, if you're out there and you want to be an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is your thing, don't dibble, don't dabble, go all in. And then once you're all in, yes, there's going to be some mistakes, there's going to be some setbacks, but it'll happen so much faster. What I, what, I, what I see happening today, and I did it, they dibble and they dabble and they dabble and they dibble. And the that mean they're not they don't want to do it. That I mean, they're uncertain. It just, they're not all in. And so make a decision that whatever you're going to do, you're going to put the pedal to the metal. You might say, well, Shay, I don't want to be chaotic. I mean, I'm the tipper. everything has got to be in order. That's okay. This conversation isn't for you. The conversation is if I can go back and talk to myself 30 plus years ago or someone else 30 plus years ago, what advice would I would give them? Go for it. Trust your gut and just go for it. The mistake happened. Put it behind you as fast as you can and go for it again. You find yourself going through a divorce, put it behind you. Find the person or love you want to find yourself again. Find yourself upside down in your credit cards and, and debt. So, Scott, how you know what to do? Don't worry about it. Put it behind you. Go out there and make the money and pay the debt off. You want to build a relationship back with a family member? Do it faster. So everything that I would do, I would do so much faster because I believe I would be where I'm at now a long time ago. I think how many more years I would have to enjoy that time, by the way. I don't know how that happened. That's kind of cool. My <laughs> Zoom thing. So, so that's so. my advice to myself is, is, is do it faster. 
go faster, do it faster. Don't dibble, don't dabble, be all in. If you do that, it solves the other two things that most folks are going to tell you. They're going to tell you, have the right mindset, whatever that means these days. And they're going to tell you, never quit, whatever that means, right? I'm telling you, don't quit, but you have to make the decision first and then go for it. And you do that, you'll always be chasing your passion. You'll always be chasing your purpose. And you're going to live a more happy and fulfilled life. I didn't say just be happy because what does it matter if you have all the things you want, but there's no joy and there's no fulfillment. And that's mm -hmm. kind of the place that I'm finding myself in now looking for just more fulfillment and just being happy with where I'm at. Take the baby steps, but in rapid form. Definitely. Yeah. Fail faster. Yeah. Just do it. Nike said yeah. it best. <laughs> now, if you had a magic wand and could change anything at all right now in the sales industry, wave it, it's done. What do you feel like that would be? If I could wave a magic wand and change everything right now, the one thing that I would change in our industry is a perception that sales is a dirty game. That the mm. sales are something that people do because they can't do anything else. You know, you think of a salesperson, and I remember I was speaking on a stage many years ago, and I used to always say, hey, we think of a salesperson, what do you do? What do you think of? People raise their hand and say, car salesman, you, you know? Someone else would say, someone trying to cheat you. Someone else would say, liar. I'm like, oh God, it's going to be a long day. And if you think about it, none of us that are small business owners, most of us, we're not that way. We're honest people. We pay our taxes. We want to take care of our families. We want to provide, we want a good community. So if I could just wave a magic wand, it would take off the stigma that sales is something you do when you can't get a job. Now, I would agree. I never thought, she asked the question, opened this up with the question, so it's kind of ironic she's coming here now. What, you know, what did you want to be when you were younger? I never said I wanted to be a salesperson. I mean, I don't know one person is walking around high school right now. Maybe there is, but I will say this because I'm not that young anymore, but I will say when they look at it now, they understand that selling is the highest profession in the world. There is unlimited financial potential. Mm -hmm. You can serve, you can, you can solve a problem. The bigger the problem, the more they pay you, the more you solve it, the more consistent the money comes in. And I always tell folks, you never have a money problem. You have a sales problem. Never a money problem. You can, it's, it's impossible to have a money problem. It's just impossible. So we have to drill the onion. So if I can wait a magic wand, it'd be take off the stigma that it's nasty, that it's dirty, that when I mean, you see a sales person coming, no, no, no. Embrace them. And you might say, Shay, why is that? Give me three reasons why. Let me give those to you. Because selling equals service. I started that earlier, right? That's one of our 12 rules. Selling equals service. Selling is about three things. And I'm, I'll come back to you. But I want to wave this wand. I want you to make sure you get this loud and clear. Because I was working with someone who was in financial planning. She didn't see herself in sales. She came to me and said, hey, Shay, if I don't start making money, I gotta go back and get a job. She needed to get to about $5,200 in salary or, or payout that she get every month in order to not have to go get a job. Now, that might not sound like a lot of money to you, but that was a lot of money to her, okay, $5,200 a month. And this was eight, nine years ago. This ain't 20, whatever you see this, 2024, okay? Let's be clear. This was back in the teens sometime. But anyway, so I said, well, why don't you just stop resistance selling and why don't you embrace it? And I asked her three questions. I said, can you at least share with people that there's a problem that exists? She said, well, I can do that. Because you're in insurance, right? I said, so selling equals education. Put that down your notes. That's number one. Selling equals education. Can you at least educate people that there's a problem, whether they work with you or not, it exists. Okay, I can do that. And number two, selling is about leading. Can you at least share with them how your company solves that problem, whether they work with you or not, Carol, can you do that? She says, I can do that too. So selling is about education. She can do that. Selling is about leading. Here's how I solve the problem, whether they work with me or not. And number three, selling is about moving people to action. Can you at least ask them, would you like to do it? If they say no, they say no. Ain't no big deal. We're not trying to convince them. I don't teach persuasion and, and influence. And you can do this if you do wave. And no, no, no. If you like to do it, here's how we solve it. If not, no big deal. And when she adopted that philosophy, and it wasn't my idea. It was something I learned. I passed it on to her. You know what it did? Changed her life. Full time. Still full time. A dream that she had. Again, everybody doesn't have that dream. Some of you want to be nine to five millionaires. Nothing wrong with that. You work your nine to five job and you have your small business. You're going to be a nine to five millionaire. There's no shame in having to work nine to five at all. 
but that's not what she wanted to do. So if I could wave that wand, I would say anybody, even as a, even as a CEO of the business, take off the hat to selling is something that someone else does. No, as a CEO, your number one job is to have that business be profitable. And you are responsible for the sales organization and what's inside of it. So spend a little time. And I say this every morning, I'm done. If you can't focus on sales, you can't be in business. So I would change that philosophy so that every CEO is always focused on what's going on in the sales organization and what resources do they need so they can be effective because they're paying everyone else's salary. I know I'm a little biased, but hey, no one else brings in revenue but sales. I mean, I don't know of another department that does that. I don't, I don't think there another- is another department that does that. I, th- I think you're correct. Selling is service. Then you've been outstanding. But, and I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Please, they're the best way for the viewers to find you. Yes, if you're out there, the best way to find us, you can go over to www.easy, E-A-S-Y, easysaleshub.com, www.easysaleshub.com. Once you get over there, you just follow the instructions, get the Evergreen Revenue Playbook as our gift to you, and, and use that. Use that in your business. What about me? You don't need me. Just take the playbook, look at the playbook, and dot what works best for you, and implement it in your business. That's the best way to connect with me. If you're on social media, which I'm sure you are, you can find me over at, at I am Che Brown. This is my name. I, then A-M, and then my name, Che Brown. I am Che Brown. You can see me, but I can't see you. So drop me a DM. Let me know what you enjoyed most <laughs> about this. I'll respond back personally, so it's not an AI bot or something like that. It's me. So I'd like to know what you're up to. So why don't we connect, by the way? Wouldn't that be so cool? Isn't that how to all get started through these fiber optic lines? So yeah, hopefully I get an opportunity to connect with a number of you out there who are listening to us right now. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I thank you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing God's work. It's needed, much needed. You might sound like sometimes you're just another voice in the force, but you know, we're going to make sure now we help people, you know, get out of Egypt because a lot of them are out of Egypt now as entrepreneurs. You left Egypt, but the only question is where you get to the promised land. Are you going to wander in the wilderness? We're doing, we're going to get to the promised land. Isn't that kind of crazy? Isn't that kind of cool? You're not going to just wander around in the wilderness. No, no, no. As an entrepreneur, sometimes you might feel like, Shay, I feel like I'm out here cutting grass mm-hmm. with scissors you any longer we're gonna get you a riding lawnmower come on somebody okay i couldn't resist that i she told me to be i try to be cool i try to be you know answer the questions as they're asked but i just couldn't help we're at the end now thanks for tuning in god bless you i appreciate you shit you're outstanding i thank you thank you peace